HBO's Chernobyl gripped audiences with the haunting aftermath of nuclear meltdown and the horrifying transformation of the power plant and its local surrounds, including the town of Pripyat and its 50,000 souls. To me, one of the most jarring and astonishing narratives of the miniseries was that of the dog hunters, soldiers who had to hunt and kill radiated animal life to contain the outbreak. We weren't just watching an evacuation, but a catastrophe turning the land into a ruin of what it once was. Surprisingly to some, but maybe not to others, HBO's miniseries led to an increase in tourism in that ruined region of Ukraine. According to Reuters, one Chernobyl tourism agency saw an uptick of nearly 40%. And now, years later, HBO's new series returns us to a world of ruins. These pictures of the American city of Detroit are from the book Ruins of Detroit by French photographers Yves Marchand and Romain Meffry. Here, they explore the industrial decay of a 20th century manufacturing juggernaut. In the 1950s, Metro Detroit was home to nearly 2 million people. It was the fourth biggest city in the United States. Today, numbers less than a million. To these photographers, ruins are the visible symbols and landmarks of our societies and their change. Small pieces of history in suspension. A decade ago, there was a rejuvenation in Runenlust, a German word that roughly translates to obsession of ruins or love of destruction. There was a renewed fascination with ruins, leading to an increase in exhibitions in UK museums. And year by year, more tourists visit the ruins of Pompeii, the Roman city ruined at the hands of Mount Vesuvius. Ruins are this mixture of horror, regret, nostalgia, and majesty. If you've ever walked through the ruins of antiquity, be they Greek, Roman, Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Chinese, or otherwise, you always marvel. The classic line of people walked and talked around these ruins thousands of years ago. Ruins are a mirror to our own histories. They are able to show us the past, the present, and the future simultaneously. Their ability to become so loaded with story is perhaps why ruins feature so prominently in games, a highly visual and interactive medium. If you take a peek across the gaming landscape of the past decade or more, you'll see the dominance of ruins in some of our most favorite and beloved worlds. 2022's Game of the Year is the most recent and dominant example of ruins being such a dominant world building and narrative force in a game world. All of the lands between is some kind of ruin. But before we go too much further down the path of Elden Ring, I want to talk about my first ruin in gaming. Kavach. Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion is set during the Oblivion Crisis. The Imperial line of succession is in disarray, and in that weakness, the Daedric realm of Oblivion inches ever closer. But for the first 45 minutes to whenever of this game, you don't fully grasp the line, close shut the jaws of oblivion. The assassination of the Emperor is shocking, sure, but when you step out into the Greenlands of Cyrodiil, everything still seems alright. Until your quest brings you to Kavach, the ruined city of Kavach. This sequence demonstrates so many narrative components in its about 60 minute runtime. It hits on what a ruin is meant to show to an audience the past, the present, and the future simultaneously. We see what happens to a city victim to an oblivion gate, we see the current devastation and conflict, and the player is implicitly told what will happen if the crisis is not averted, and what will happen to all of their favorite cities in Cyrodiil. Not only that, but this quest sequence is also, I think, if you're coming straight from the Imperial City, the kind of first instance when you can see NPCs that you meet die. When NPCs can fall under your command, and how your agency pushes the drive to reclaim Kavach, and more. Putting players in places of ruin is an incredibly efficient way to load vast amount of meanings in a short period. In any sort of heroic adventure, sequences of ruin are so deeply layered. And while the experience of Kavach might not be one of those moments so universally recognized in the pantheon of video games, the exploration of a ruined city in part one has become archetypal to so many video game narratives. This brings us to Elden Ring. <laughs> 
a game that, according to Steam Replay, dominated my video game experiences in 2022. As someone who has played only Dark Souls 1 and a bit of 2 and 3, Elden Ring open world format just jived with me more. And I think the reason why was the presentation of the Ruin of Limbo. Exploring this area with a friend will forever be in some of my top gaming experiences ever. The rush across the field to Castle Morn, the scaling of Stormvale, the descent into mines, the finding of old temples, the first experience in that underground river, and more. But more importantly, because there was an overall sadness and relatability to Limgrave, it gave a motivation to correct it. More to me than Lurnia or Kaelid or Lindell ever did. NPCs you meet in Limgrave are all trying to restore it from what it is, or to, to avenge, or to protect, or to right the wrong. And to me, that again presented the threefold narrative of what ruins do. You wondered what Limgrave once was before America threw the world into war. You explored Limgrave of the present and seen the calamity that it is. And you envisioned what Limgrave could become if you become Elden Lord. And now when I think further, that theme of ruin has a thread across so many of my most memorable gaming experiences. The Protheans in Mass Effect, the post-apocalypse of The Last of Us, the old churches in Hunt Showdown, the dark subways of Metro, the sunken city of Rapture and Bioshock. All of these show the past, present, and future at the same time, and are such vessels of emotional narrative storytelling in video games. And so I think perhaps my experiences in both Kavach and Limgrave note this powerful emotion that game developers seek to entice in a gamer, that of a restorer, a hero who has the ability to right the wrong of the past. And I don't think I'm alone in this. One of the few leading articles in this analysis of ruins in video games agrees. Video games and the aesthetics of ruins by David Chandler suggests that games cast the player as someone to set the world right again. And so when we talk about the power of that fantasy, I think the role of ruins even makes more sense. How often is an individual empowered to be able to right the wrongs of the past? And so how satisfying is to have it a player have that experience in a game? I think one of the missteps in Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings is not quite emphasizing the significance of Asgiliath. It was the first capital city of Gondor. There's a reason why this premonition scene here has Aragorn buried there and not at the towering majesty of Minas Tirith. There's a reason too why Boromir is seen as such a hero. He recaptured the capital of Gondor. And there's a reason why Faramir losing it is also so significant. Gondor was and is a place of ruin. And so there's consequence too in all of these games about the hero, the player, failing. Like Chandler says, we are the restorer. It's probably why, as a little kid, you want to pretend to be Aragorn. You want to pretend to take on the role of the restorer to wield that agency. And so games are designed to give us that agency. Our victory is transformative. And we also know that our defeat can be transformative too. The world will stay as a ruin or fall deeper into it. And through seeing Kavach and Limgrave and fallen temples and apocalyptic landscapes, these stories stick with us more than others. At least that's what I believe. Because there's this whisper in the back of our heads that if we fall, all will come to darkness and my city to ruin. <laughs>